Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to welcome all of you to the Calhoun County Joint Information Center briefing for Wednesday, September 30th, 2020. Some administrative notes, please mute your phone if you haven't already. This is a listen only meeting except for prearranged speakers, but if you do have something you wanna say, please use the chat feature. Unified command team, Kelly Scott, Calhoun County Administrator and Controller, Rebecca Fleury, City of Battle Creek Manager, and Bridget Reichenbaugh today, Calhoun County Public Health Department Deputy Health Officer. Go to the next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, we're just waiting for the slide here for a second. While we're waiting for the slide uh, to change, I will tell you the Joint Operations Center uh, a little bit about that. The idea is that behind this uh, effort of communication in a broad way is to save lives, mitigate suffering, of course, protect the vulnerable, develop a countywide approach, which I think has happened very, very well, create a virtual Joint Operations Center, which has been going for some time now, many months, I think seven, Respond to impacts and effect of the shelter in place order when that is applicable. Anticipate and prepare for COVID increase surge capability. And that's kind of something that the health department is doing on a hourly basis. And kudos to them for the hard work. Anticipate, prepare for COVID increase and develop a plan to reset, stabilize. Have we got a slide change yet? Nope. I mean, just one second, Dirk. I had um, Cindy send, this is Sarah, I had Cindy send them to me, so I'm going to try and share them. Okay, that sounds good. A reminder to you, uh, the purpose of the Joint Information Center today is to provide current and relevant information regarding actions, activities, and resources in the JOC in a combined format, community and elected leadership, as well as the media to listen and determine the needs of all jurisdictions in Calhoun County. And that's why we're, that's the reason we're here today. Yeah, getting closer on the slides. Apologize for the technical difficulty here. We'll get her going. And we can go to the next slide if possible. I know you're working on it. Okay, and we can go to the next slide. What screen are you seeing now, Dirk? I am seeing Unified Command Team, Kelly, Rebecca, Bridget. How about now? Uh, the same. Okay, now we've got the Joint Operations Center. So we go next slide, please. And we can do next slide, please. Okay, very good. We are on our agenda at this point. And to kick us off today will be Bridget Reichenbaugh from the Health Department. Bridget, go right ahead. Next slide. So as you can see here, uh, we've had a significant surge in cases over the last week. Um, currently we're at 1,324 positive cases, 45 deaths reported, and nine persons currently hospitalized um, in Calhoun County. 
Um, of those, 975 persons have been released from isolation orders. The primary source of these cases is coming from mass gatherings and large community events. Next slide, please. And this is a graph showing, of course, our um, cases since it started. And you can see there the um, increase over the last really week, couple days in cases. Next slide, please. So again, as I mentioned earlier, um, the majority of our cases are community gatherings, um, family gatherings, weddings, funerals, birthday parties, um, and various religious um, services. We are really encouraging people to try to avoid those gatherings when the social distancing is not an option um, and to limit those activities whenever possible to outside activities where you have a larger opportunity to social distance and maintain that six feet or further um, away from other individuals. Next slide. So as a result of our um, surge in cases and our limited staffing capacity to handle these and investigate and kind of do the contact tracing that is required, we've had to once again limit temporarily limit our clinic services to flu vaccinations, immunizations, and TB testing. Um, we will continue seeing current um, STI and family planning clients. However, new services will just temporarily be put on hold until we can get our nursing capacity um, back up to speed. Um, We've revised our clinic schedules as noted there, and I will also be um, sending out an additional press release indicating that. Um, next slide, please. Another reason for limiting our clinic services is now that it's flu season, our flu vaccines will begin tomorrow. Um, we have various clinics and that will also be included in a full press um, release dedicated specific to flu vaccine. Um, and again, it's really important. We're really urging residents this year to get the flu vaccine um, and particularly due to the COVID um, activity that is pandemic that is happening right now. Next slide. Okay, thanks, okay, before everybody. we go to, oh, Bridget, I'm sorry. I'm yeah. sorry, Bridget, were you done? Go ahead, Dirk. Before we go to Kelly Scott, mm -hmm. a message on chat from Susan Baldwin. And I'll read the message because you probably haven't had a chance to, but we'll stay on topic. The graph from Susan Baldwin, the graph for number of confirmed cases only reports a general number <laughs> now that we have surpassed 1,000 cases. Prior to this, the number was specifically reported. Can the dashboard be adjusted to show the accurate daily number? This is an important information from Susan Baldwin. I, I can help with this. Um, I actually asked Susan which link she was looking at, and it's to our GIS map. And so this is something that we can um, take a look at and see, you know, it sounds like if it's, um, you know, something having to do with that dashboard, it's going to be something that our GIS will have to handle. And so we'll work with them. Um, but between them and uh, myself with the county website, we're always keeping an eye on this. So definitely let me know if you have uh, specific things that you'd like to see. Um, um, and in this case, it's going to be our GIS dashboard. So I'll work with them to see if, um, you know, it looks like maybe we can change the, um, if it's, if it has to do with like the graphs, we can adjust that. So I'll well, take a I look wanna, at this is, this is Susan Baldwin. I don't know whether you can hear me. Mm -hmm. um, yes, we can, Susan. Thank you. I want to make sure you understand which one I'm referring to. If you open up that dashboard, it's the upper left corner and there's an increasing line that goes up and it used to give exact numbers. And once we hit a thousand, like today, it just says 1.3K. Um, I really would like to have those because this is pretty dramatic what we've had happen over the last couple of weeks. 
and I'd like that number to be very specific. So I just want to make sure you, you've got an understanding of what my concerns were. Absolutely. And Susan, I think actually I might reach out to you separately because I might be able to um, show you if you're just seeing 1.3, it might be um, because you're on a mobile or something like that because I'm seeing the full number. But regardless, I can also show you where you can find that number too on the county website. So I'll reach out to you separately as well to help you with that. But I agree, that is a very important number and we are tracking the dailies. There's a couple places where you can see it. You can also see the number of daily cases that we have on the epi, um, I always say it wrong, the epi curve, which is on our cumulative data page on the county website as well. And what's nice about that is that'll show you the daily cases per day too. So we're, those are definitely um, things we're tracking and hopefully uh, we can, I can help you with that. All right. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Very good. Thank Lucy, thank you so much. And we'll let you hook up separately with Susan. Before we go to, oh, Bridget, did you have anything you wanted to add or are you good for now? I'm good for now. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you, Bridget, very much. And we need to go a couple slides ahead before we get to Kelly. One more. There we go. And Kelly Scott. Okay. There we go. Good afternoon, everyone. I agree with Commissioner Baldwin that um, data is very important. So I'm going to start with a couple of easy to remember statistics. As of yesterday, more than 1 million people have died of the coronavirus worldwide, less than nine months after the first death was confirmed in China. And the United States unfortunately tops the list with more than 200,000 deaths. As of today, more than 1 million Americans have already cast their ballots in the presidential election. So 1 million, 1 million, those are easy um, numbers to remember. What I find not as easy to keep track of are the number of our state's executive orders uh, within this year, which now total 190. So they also include this week's continuation of the declaration of the state of emergency within Michigan, which now extends through October 27. <clears throat> so um, today I'll highlight in this uh, presentation two of the most recent executive orders. Um, one relating to the safe start reopening restrictions, which is on this slide. And another one I wanna to touch on relates to workforce safety. And both of those were signed since our last uh, JIC briefing last Wednesday. Um, thank you to Battle Creek City Attorney Jill Steele for providing our Joint Operations Center with some great summary information uh, to help me for today. So <clears throat> Executive Order 183 replaces the prior Safe Start Executive Orders. So there are three of them that are now rescinded as of October 9. And the new executive order permits certain indoor sport venues, theaters, entertainment facilities to reopen with capacity limitations. It also increases the number of persons that may attend indoor and outdoor social gatherings, depending on whether they are residential or non-residential settings, and then organize sports events. <clears throat> and I think we really need a flowchart to determine compliance with this executive order, but I haven't seen one. And I'll just mention, it also involves some math skills. So um, in general, starting October 9, this order increases the number of persons that are not part of the same household that are permitted to gather. And definitions are important to note. And in this order, gatherings includes um, the items that Bridget, Bridget mentioned where we're seeing some increased cases, weddings, funerals, family parties. But gatherings also includes business meetings. And I that's important to note. Um, just a reminder that prior executive orders limited in our region limited our indoor events to 10 persons or fewer and outdoor events to 100 persons or fewer um, except for the regions up north. And those limits of 10 and 100 are still in place for the next week. So starting October 9, <clears throat> um, in addition to gatherings um, of of the larger sizes, this new executive order um, provides for events based on a venue's seating capacity or square footage. So you have to you have to know that you have to know whether there is a fixed seating capacity. Um, you potentially need to know the square footage if if you're hosting a gathering. So here's where the math comes in. In our region, which is Region Three, and in all of the other regions in Michigan except for six and eight, which are Traverse City and the UP. Indoor gatherings and events will now be limited to 20 people per 1,000 square feet of space 
or 20% of a fixed seating capacity if the venue actually has a fixed seating capacity. And in no case, even if it's a very large venue, um, no case more than 500 people indoors. So here's where the, the residential versus non-residential comes in. <clears throat> so if you are having a gathering at your home, um, that is still continues to be limited indoors to 10 people. So you don't need math for that. Um, if you're having a party in your backyard, the outdoor gathering is still limited to 100 people or fewer. So that is not increasing uh, with this new executive order. And even then, um, the social distancing requirement is still in place, meaning people that are not from the same household need to maintain six feet of distance. Up north in region six and eight, those limits are higher. So I won't go into that. Um, another definition that I, th I think is important for us to note is that when we talk about indoors, um, that you know, is, is not just the traditional building. Um, indoor spaces also include barns, garages, uh, vehicles, including buses, tour buses. Uh, they also include temporary structures. So tents, canopies with sidewalls, coverings, those are all considered indoors for the purposes of limiting um, gatherings, whether it's residential or not. So outdoors, um, the events of up to 1,000 people would be permitted. Um, at the most, but that is also limited to the lesser of the capacity of 30% of a fixed seating or 30 people per thousand square feet. Um, this order also allows um, recreational facilities. I think the headlines talked about uh, bowling alleys and, and arcades uh, to open. So these are all considered uh, places of public accommodation because they require or they involve um, people in close contact with one another when they're having fun, basically. So amusement parks, arcades, bingo halls, bowling centers, climbing facilities, roller rinks, ice rinks, um, carnival rides can also open on October 9. And before October 9, you may have noticed that, that, for example, we have bowling centers within Calhoun County they were allowed to be open, but only for organized sports um, under previous restrictions and guidelines. Another thing I want to note about this Executive Order 183 is that even under this new Safe Start order, <clears throat> bars, restaurants, and nightclubs still have to close their common areas in which people can congregate, dance, or otherwise mingle. So there's still, you know, restrictions on those. And then finally, organized sports under the new Executive Order. Um, the highlights there really are that if you have a live audience, the organizer has to ensure that the number of guests um, for each athlete is two, and there cannot be any concessions sold at the indoor venues. Um, I guess one final note I did want to mention on Executive Order 183 is that it reiterates the requirement that in our region and all of them except for the two up north, any work capable of being performed remotely um, must still be performed remotely. So that does you know, continue to impact all of us as employers. And then I just wanna highlight, it's not on a slide, but the, the executive order right after this one, 184, uh, replaces the most recent executive order addressing safeguards to protect Michigan workers from COVID-19. So it updates guide, guidance on workplace safety I mean, really, it was necessary because these other businesses that were previous closed, previously closed are slated to reopen on October 9. Um, there were not any, not too many substantive changes, um, but I'll highlight the, the three that are included. Um, so offices must still prohibit social gatherings and meetings that do not allow for social distancing. We're still uh, required to use virtual meetings whenever possible. So the county is, is continuing to do that for the foreseeable future for our board and committee meetings. Um, offices did get a little relief in that we're no longer required to suspend all non-essential visitors. Um, and non-essential is, is one of those definitions that I'm not sure any of us um, ha has seen. And then also, finally, this Executive Order 184 added that um, the, the public accommodations facilities, so sports entertainment facilities, um, theaters, bowling alleys, must maintain accurate records, including the date and time of entry, names of patrons, and contact information 
so that they have that to aid with contact tracing. Um, if patrons re are, didn't, are refusing to give that information to at least provide their name and phone number, um, they are required to deny entry. So I think that will be an interesting implementation item for how, you know, how they're going to gather that information. Um, and, and then finally, um, the facial coverings um, requirement in the previous workplace safety order was encouraged. Now it's mandated um, all times while in the facility. Um, offices, public accommodations are, are, they're just making a stronger statement about the mandate to wear facial coverings. So in closing, um, I would just reiterate, I think what, you know, what Bridget's message was in, in that even if you don't have a flow chart and can't navigate all these executive orders, if you're within six feet of people that don't live in your household and you're not wearing a mask, um, should think twice about the risk that, that is, um, that you are subjecting yourself to and others. So um, just keep in mind that the fewer people that you're not living with, that you're interacting at a close contact with every day, um, that's how we're seeing the community spread. So that's my spiel on the executive orders update. Thank you, Dirk. Okay, thank you very much, Kelly, for the EO updates and, and the comprehensive report. Thank you. Uh, Battle Creek City Manager, Rebecca Fleury. Thanks, Dirk. I appreciate that. Um, you know, as we see um, executive orders come out that allow us to think about opening, some of our facilities have been closed for a very long time. Um, the city is looking at full blast and we will be opening um, that recreation center Monday, October the 5th. Um, but again, we're going to take all the precautions uh, necessary to ensure any visitor and our employees remain safe while we open this facility. So um, hours will be 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Friday and 9 to 5 on Saturday and closed on Sunday. Again, those um, screening uh, procedures will be in place as anyone enters that facility. Masks, as Kelly has indicated, um, will be required as well as the social distancing guidelines. Um, the fit fitness center will open, but for those of you who've been there, you'll notice that, of course, the equipment is spread much further apart to encourage that social distancing. And we will be limiting um, those spectators at court um, activities to two spectators per athlete. Um, and we will stick to the 25% capacity. Um, those needing uh, Battle Creek Transit passes can continue um, to buy those now at the front desk at full blast now that that facility is back opening. And as far as fall programs go, we are still working on that with our recreation department. Next slide, please. You know, I think um, Halloween has been on um, everybody's mind. It's not even October yet, and I do see Christmas decorations going up. So, you know, uh, Halloween has brought out a lot of questions um, coming in, I'm sure, to all the municipalities in Calhoun County um, about trick-or-treating and hours and will we have it. So we really look to the guidelines that come out from both the CDC and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, and those links are provided here. Um, the CDC has labeled trick-or-treating as a high risk, and MDHHS is offering some advice on how to do those things safely. So as you talk about it as a family and with your kids of trick-or-treating age, be sure that if you're going to participate in these, you do it safely, or you consider maybe alternate ways uh, to celebrate Halloween in your family or in your neighborhood. Locally, we are still talking about, you know, how we're going to handle some of these large events. I know many um, look for trunk or treat and other activities by organizations in not only Battle Creek, but throughout Calhoun County. And as soon as we have some final information, we will make sure that we share that broadly through social media, press releases, and other things. Um, so please uh, stay tuned. We want to make sure that we are considering all of our options and possibilities and working very closely with the health department um, to understand, you know, the risk if we move forward with some of those events. Next slide, please. You know, I think Dirk said at the beginning that, you know, we have had the Joint Operations Center up and running for seven months. Um, and all this while, you know, we have so many people in the community making sure that things like food and basic supplies continue to be distributed um, throughout the county. So just recently, we got an update of just in the past two weeks, um, you know, we see food being distributed at Restoration Life Church. 
um, by Faith-Based Coalition and Care World Services. Um, on the north side, fam for families on the north side, the Washington Heights United Methodist Church has recently distributed 150 boxes in collaboration with the Faith-Based Coalition and RISE. Um, and on the east side, St. Mark has distributed 100 boxes, um, again, with the help of the Faith-Based faith-based coalition and rise. I hope you noticed that we could not continue to, to provide these, these essentials, particularly food, without the wonderful community volunteers we have everywhere in the county. And, and you'll see that as we move forward. Um, next slide, please. Thanks. And I do, I also want to, besides the um, Faith-Based Coalition and RISE, I want to lift up just the fabulous work that Care Well Services has been doing. Um, I know Carla is on this call, so I'll, I'll do my best to celebrate her works and um, all of their efforts and her volunteers um, because they are still out purchasing groceries and delivering medications and meeting needs um, for COVID positive families, as well as those who are isolated and quarantined. And for those families or persons that may be homebound or disabled or elderly who just need some assistance um, beyond what they may normally need during this COVID time. Um, Carewell themselves had distributed 150 food boxes per week in collaboration and partnership with the food bank and with the senior the senior center high rises. So they're getting into these facilities that are housing a lot of our senior citizens and making sure food boxes are getting to them. And they're rotating so that um, each one gets a monthly delivery. Uh, and appreciate that they're also recognizing that some extra boxes have been needed in our homeless shelters with both the Haven clients and the Share Center clients. Uh, weekly food distribution continues in Homer. And um, I know that Carla and her team are transitioning to work with the, with P, with the public health department to increase the, the flu vaccinations, um, particularly in older adults. And I think you heard Bridget say that it's really important, especially for seniors and those with other medical um, uh, compromises to really get your flu vaccines this year, because not only are we in a global pandemic, but we are, food, flu season is here. So please do everything you can to keep yourself healthy and get that vaccine. Thanks. I'm all set, Dirk. Okay, Rebecca, thank you very much for that report. A lot of things to remember and think about. Uh, we want to move on now and take our attention to our elected officials, see if we have any comments. And I'd like to start that off with Senator Bison. Hi, everyone. This is Karen Todd uh, from Senator Bison's office. I hope everyone is doing well today. I had a few things here. Um, thank you, Kelly, for detailing out those executive orders. Uh, gosh, wow. We can uh, really get weighed down in those. But, um, but thank you for detailing those out. Um, let's see. Uh, also, the state of emergency was already discussed. So I will um, just briefly share with you um, the Michigan Senate, I think last Wednesday, uh, late in the evening, passed um, the uh, fiscal year 2021 budget. And uh, it's, it's very long, uh, but I will um, point out some of the highlights. Um, there was broadband connectivity grants. Um, Pure Michigan was funded in the, bu in the budget. Um, uh, some other highlights include nursing homes, PPE, um, funding to the Going Pro, pro uh, program, Michigan Reconnect, um, the Restricted Tuition Incentive Fund, um, also uh, the, uh, the uh, Michigan uh, Strategic Fund has approved a total of uh, $19.8 million dollars in the community, block, community Development Block Grant, Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security, uh, the, the CARES Act um, funding. Uh, 439,000 of that went to Calhoun County. Um, and so the, the, it's, a, it's a very long budget. Um, if, if you have any, want any details, uh, we certainly can provide you with those. Um, and I think the only other thing I had a, a bright spot is um, yesterday I had the pleasure of um, presenting two tributes to two of our Calhoun County deputies. Um, the first one was Joel Flees, Deputy Joel Flees, Calhoun County uh, Deputy um, for Distinguished Officer of the Year. And that was um, 
he was given that title by the Police Officers Association of Michigan and also Deputy Curtis Smith, Calhoun County Deputy. Um, he was named um, Police Officers Association, Association of Michigan Officer of the Year. And so um, I just wanted to congratulate them and um, would make a, a good um, good article for any media on the, on the line today. Um, so I think that's all that I have, unless anyone has any questions. And as always, if you guys have questions, you can contact the office. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that report. We really appreciate that. Uh, I'm gonna move on now to Representative Hadsma. One more shot for the representative or somebody representing representing the representative. <laughs> Say that fast three times. Okay, moving on down the list, Representative Hall. Okay, we'll move on to the county elected officials. Hello everyone, this is Kimberly Hinckley, uh, your Calhoun County Clerk and Register of Deeds. I um, just wanted to give you guys a quick update today um, on the status of um, some absentee balloting. Um, first off, um, last week, Terry Lowe, my elections director, we can't live without, um, and I spent approximately 36 hours um, proofing and testing the programming for um, the precincts um, so that each precinct could get their AV ballots out on time, which was September 24th, to uh, reach that 40-day um, platform. Um, so we were successful. All ballots that were had applications that had been received up through the 24th have been processed and out in the mail. And I'm pleased to say that um, many are all already being returned. So um, in less than a week, we're already getting ballots back into the local precincts. A lot of questions um, out and about about that process. We're always welcome to answer any questions that anybody might have on whether it's um, the safety of your absentee ballot or can you still vote in the polls on election day and many different questions that are out in the uh, public's mind. We're more than happy to um, address those as well as, as the local clerk. And um, so please feel free if anybody has any questions, contact me or Terry or any of the local clerks will be glad to answer that. And then um, we had a meeting with several of the local clerks, your city and township clerks that have what's called an AB counting board. So an absentee um, ballot counting board. And that is they process, they have so many absentee ballots that they're processing them in their own type of precinct. And um, so we had a meeting with them today and went over um, procedures, changes to those um, policies this year, kind of get everybody on the same page. So hopefully election night, we have a smooth processing in uh, those AV County boards. And uh, as been reported, um, hopefully it won't be a week before you have your results in Calhoun County. And I'm sure we won't, I'm very positive we won't. So I just wanted to give everybody that update. Um, election is going well so far. Um, please urge your citizens as you're talking to them to make sure that they're registered, um, make sure they vote, whether it's in person or absentee, but please vote. So thank you all. Kim, thank you very much for that report. We appreciate it. Are there any other county elected officials that would like to speak today? Okay. Hearing none, we'll move on to tribal elected officials that would like to speak. And we'll move on down to city elected officials. And we will move down now to township elected officials. And finally on this, village elected officials, if there's anybody that would like to speak. Okay, very good. I'm looking at chat. I'm seeing nothing further on chat. And unless anybody has anything else, I'd like to remind you the best Information sources, is, sources are CalhounCountyMI.gov, BattleCreekMI.gov forward slash coronavirus, Michigan.gov forward slash coronavirus, 
and of course CDC. On behalf of the Unified Command Team, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today and have a very pleasant day. Thank you.